And uh, we're very honored here today to have uh, Ed Freeman uh, in this virtual fireside chat. Um, Ed is a philosopher and professor of business administration and one of the world leading theorists in strategy, ethics, and entrepreneurship. Currently teaching and researching at the University of Virginia Darden School of Business. And um, you saw the short introduction to this fireside chat here in the program, uh, which I summed up as like business is all about purpose. Stakeholder theory is not like many may think about trading off different stakeholder interests against one another, but about a values based reframing of business propositions. So um, even conflicting values can become a source of value creation together. Ed and I will deep dive deep today into uh, what we as innovation professionals here at this conference can learn when we're leveraging insights of stakeholder theory and especially Ed's recent work on, uh, on half recent work on bridging the values gap to managing innovation based on human values. So first of all, welcome Ed to uh, our fireside chat and welcome to your first participation, as you told me, to the ISPIM conference. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for having me. Great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we kind of met or got into contact three years ago when uh, we were so bold to just ask you for a testimonial for our text book on values-based innovation management and you were so kind to have a look at it and uh, give us some credentials uh, and you wrote values are the wellspring of innovation and value creation and I found something similar in your own book titled Bridging the Values Gap, the one that you wrote with Alan Auster uh, where you said that the foundation of um, values are the foundation of building a great company. So maybe to start into that session, could you explain that what is it that makes value so essential for innovation and innovation management? Well, uh, um, that's a great question, Henning. Uh, values are what's important to us, uh, regardless of whether you're a philosopher or a social scientist and you have a variety of models of what values are, uh, it better capture sort of what's important. Uh, and well, you know, most most people, most entrepreneurs start a business not because they're trying to maximize profits. They start a business because they see the world differently. They want to bring something to life. They want to uh, make the world differently uh, in a particular way. Now, it may be everything from uh, sending a mission to Mars to figuring out a uh, you know, uh, a sexier stripe on toothpaste. Uh, you know, the world is vast. The entrepreneurial I I I ideas uh, are big. But for the most part, they come from uh, who the entrepreneurs are, what their, what their, what their values uh, are. Uh, and that drives, our values drive a lot of what we do. Uh, sometimes our values drive a lot of how we deceive ourselves. We think our values are one thing, but we don't actually act that, that, that way. So uh, to say values are the wellspring of innovation, yes, and sometimes they're the wellspring of innovation gone wrong as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example for that? Well, values can go wrong. Well, uh, sure. I mean, I think there are lots of examples. I would, I would put, you know, famous uh, stories like Enron, where uh, people thought, a number of people thought that they were uh, at Enron uh, because they sort of stood for innovation and doing something different that no company had ever done. Um, and it, it may be, if you look at that more carefully, uh, people were there uh, in large part because of their egos. Mm. Uh, and so va values can, can always cut both ways. Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, talked about uh, bad faith uh, and self-deception. Uh, and that's, what, that's one of the things that makes ethics hard. We, we think we know our values, 
but it's actually, certainly since Freud, hard to understand that we know our values best. Uh, sometimes you'll talk, I'll talk to executives and they'll say, well, you know, remember Shakespeare, this above all to thine own self be true and thou canst be false to any man, says uh, Polonius to his son Laertes. Of course, the problem with that is Shakespeare thought was, was portraying Polonius as a fool. Uh, and there's not a single work of literature that's any better at, at illustrating how, how difficult it is to know your values than Hamlet. Hamlet has absolutely no clue, uh, you know, what, what he believes, uh, et cetera. Ellen Oster and I tried to say, well, thinking about your values, you got to think about at least four things, you know, what you think they are, your history, and thinking through your, your history, thinking through the set of relationships that you're enmeshed in and thinking uh, through what, what your own, uh, you know, aspirations are. Uh, and it's a project. It's not just a society that we can be authentic. You know, that, uh, yeah, great, but you know, that's, hard, that's a lot harder. So you, you, have, to see, you have to see this as, as really a lifetime's project rather than know your values, act on them, and all's right with the world. I think that's, that's a you know, fairly naive uh, view. Right, yeah. How, how do you help these executives to find out about what their authentic values that you're also writing about, uh, what, what these are, and not to go down the self-deception kind of lane? Well, you just listen and, and you listen and you ask questions and um, you encourage them to get feedback from their stakeholders. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, I, I might think my values, you know, I might think I'm a, a very uh, caring executive that I take care of my people. And then if I were to go ask the people that work for me, they might think I'm like a vicious son of a bitch. I mean, they, <laughs> you know, um, there's a great uh, book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There by, see, I've got it on my shelf somewhere. Well, I can't, uh, remember it's a very famous consult, consultant. And uh, he, he would often help ex executives by interviewing the people that worked for, for, for them. And saying, well, you know, here's here's what people are saying, and there's no there's no uh, substitute for that. In my own case, I've found that my three children uh, were never hesitant to give me feedback about my values. Um, I remember telling my son that, gee, I couldn't take him to a father-son sports camp one summer because I had to teach in Indonesia. He looked at me and said, well, dad, what's more important, your family or your job? And mm. I said, well, you know, my family, of course, Ben. And he said, well, you're not acting like it. Mm -hmm. And and the truth is he, he was right. I wasn't. I was saying one thing and doing another. Uh, and because he pushed back, we could create a lot of value. Uh, because I could change. And that's what oftentimes gets missing. If you're serious about acting on your values, you want feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't want feedback on their values, but they want most executives for, for sure. And professors too, I have to say, what they want is praise. <laughs> and the difference between, you know, asking for praise and asking for feedback is, is, is very, it's a very different thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's, yeah, that's a nice distinction. So seeking feedback from your stakeholders versus seeking praise from your the, subordinates, I'm, uh, so to say. Just uh, one more example. I'm the cook in my family and I had made fresh pasta from scratch one night for my kids when they were little, they were grown now, but just, they were little. and. Uh, I'm sitting there going, well, well, how's the pasta? And what I what I really want to know, 
but what I really want them to say is, wow, you're a great dad. We're so lucky to have you cooking <laughs> this uh, terrific food for us. Gee, wow, how incredible are you? That's what I wanted to hear. Uh -huh. What I heard, what they said was, uh, gee, do we have any Kraft's macaroni in the blue box you can make? <laughs> you know, so it was like I was absolutely crushed by 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 that. And uh, we evolved the rule in our family: if you can't deal with the feedback, don't ask for it. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. And so... uh, I think that's a that's probably a pretty good rule uh, yeah. to think about. So you feedback is as important as values. You know, trying to understand what feedback to take, what feedback not to take. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, Edgar Schein and people writing about organizational culture also stressed this aspect, right, about uh, modest inquiry uh, in order to really get this potentially eye-opening, authentic kind of feedback to better understand your situation and better understand which values are actually... Yeah, the problem is that... Uh, certainly since Stanley Milgram's experiments, uh, we know we don't always get that. Mm, yeah, you know, we, yeah. We, we, we know what we get in an authority relationship is people telling authorities what they think they want to hear. And yeah, so yeah. if you are a senior executive, you have to work at getting really good feedback. Right. Okay. So you got to create the appropriate context to even facilitate that kind of feedback to enable that. Um, you also state in uh, your book that values create value, now in the singular form, for stakeholders. And that you're referring to the works of Collins and Porras and uh, their work on Build to Last. How, I mean, since we have a lot of confusion oftentimes going on. So when we talk about values-based innovation, people think about value creation, social value creation, environmental value creation, value capture. How would you um, see the relation between these human values on the one side and the more, I don't know, I would say economically oriented value concept on the other side? Is the one well, a subset of the other or how do you see that relation? I, 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 I think that's a that's a question that it's it's easy to be confused over. Um, uh, I think all values are human va va values. How how we sort that out, uh, I don't know. Um, certainly in uh, strategy and ethics, there's a good deal of talk about economic value versus social va value. Uh, and I, I think that's uh, that distinction is just a logic mistake. Uh, if if I've got a distinction between A on the one hand and B on the other hand, and then I got a bunch of instances down here, and I got to decide whether they're an A or a B, uh, let's let's take all the interactions with stakeholders. So I hire you. Have I done something that's economic? Sure. Here, have I done something that's social? Yeah, yeah, sure. What if I sell you a product? I've done something that's economic, but you're going to use it to improve your life. I've done something that's social and vice versa for suppliers. What if I build a plant in your community? I've certainly done something that's economic and something that's social. So if all the stakeholder uh, interactions are both economic and social, then what does that tell me about this distinction between economic on the one hand and social on the other? It tells me it's a false choice. Mm -hmm. um, and and a, different, a different way to conceptualize this is to say, let, let's give up the idea about whether a, 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 a value is economic or social or environmental or spiritual. I, I don't really care. Um, what businesses do is they create value as much as they can for their stakeholders. And the right, the right unit of analysis is the stakeholder relationship, not the particular transaction. In a particular transaction, you might ask yourself, well, is this an economic transaction or a social transaction? I would say that's a bad question, but a lot of people wouldn't. Um, but if you're saying, look, what's important in this is this relationship. Um, and <clears throat> when I say relationship, I mean that. 
it's a in relationships as opposed to transactions there's an assumption that this is going to continue there's an assumption uh that you know uh any any human relationship you have with somebody uh, you want them to be value creating value creating for you and value creating uh for the other party uh, but you don't keep store all the time if you have a relationship with some somebody you don't go in at the end of the day and say, hey, I'm, uh, you know, you're two up, you owe me two. Uh, certainly, uh, my wife and I have been married for 44 years. If I were to go into her office down the hall and say, hey, babe, I think after 44 years, you owe me three. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what the answer would be. She's also a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. So I'm pretty sure that wouldn't be a good thing for me. But we need to take seriously the idea that great businesses are, are constellations of relationships that exist over time in which there's a presumption that it's gonna continue. Now, sometimes that presumption is broken. Sometimes relationships have to end, uh, but it's fundamentally different than looking at it as a one-off transaction. The problem is most of our theory, and in, in certainly our business theory, is based on an economics that looks at what that, that starts with, you know, it's a transaction. Uh, and 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 I think that's that's not uh, well, uh, depending on what kind of problem you're trying to solve, not not the best way to start. If I think about great businesses, they create value for their stakeholders. And that value is multifaceted. And I, I don't think it matters so much what kind of value it is uh, as creating it and continuing to create it over time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, great, thank you. Um, I think that's quite quite revealing now i mean if we look into business organizations then i mean obviously there's no way of doing those without relationships there's also no way for a business to survive without somehow creating and capturing value um, on the one side on the other side they're more or less advanced and we briefly talked about that before because they deal with human values to different degrees of maturity. And in this one European uh, project named Impact, we are trying to develop such a maturity model where we're thinking about different levels, one to five from oftentimes small companies, little startups, young companies, where values are just implicitly effective, right? Often they don't even talk about it unless they have some values conflict among the founders. Then um, we move on to the companies that go through some formalization of their values and then say, uh, okay, so what's our mission? What's our vision? What's our purpose? And so on. And sometimes that ends in having these kind of entry hall values, right? You mentioned the example of Enron here. Um, then we have val uh, companies that are even more advanced. They specify a purpose or values for specific innovation projects and uh, really reason upon why what that kind of innovation should be good for. And someone in this conference said, actually, the evil side of innovation is innovation without such a purpose, right, which we can argue about. But um, other companies are even more advanced and operationalize these values for innovation or use them to continuously reflect uh, upon their own performance and refine their values and their output in order to ensure they have a positive impact on society as such. And we have another um, one of these fireside chats coming up here with Ecosia, the founder of Ecosia, which I would say is one of the uh, social business or the purpose driven businesses uh, that actually uh, aligns with this level five. What I did not talk about now and uh, is another dimension that's I think equally important here and you stress the importance of relations and stakeholder relations. Um, how would you think these 
should be represented or how would you see different levels of stakeholder engagement on these increasing levels of yeah, values-based innovation maturity? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm probably the wrong person to, to, uh, to ask that question. I, I, have, I, I, have, I have tried not to engage in grand model building so that you know these companies are absolutely the best at this and these are almost as good and these are not quite as good and these are etc et I, I think that reinforces the idea about business that there there is one or a few but let's say usually one best way to do things uh and that cuts against my sort of philosophical pragmatism that, hey, there are lots of ways to run great, innovative, ethical biz businesses. And how you do it depends in large part on, yeah, purpose and what you stand for, the set of stakeholders you're trying to uh, uh, create value for, uh, et cetera. And so I, I've tried to stay away from the the, the, the one size fits all. I mean, let me, let me give an example. People have criticized uh, my work for many, many years for not giving a, <clears throat> a absolute definite idea of who's a stakeholder and who's not. Um, and, and, you know, my take on that is, well, it, it depends on what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, if what you're trying to do is figure out uh, what your purpose is, uh, you know, you, you probably look at a certain set of stakeholders. So what you're trying to do is figure out how this particular piece of legislation in country X, you know, affects your marketing in country X. You, you probably need a much broader set of stakeholders. So uh, my, my view is this depends on the kind of problem you're trying to solve and ultimately depends on the kind of business it is. I think business is what philosophers uh, would call um, a family resemblance idea. Uh, family resemblance idea is one where you really can't define it, but there are lots of them. I think leadership's a family resemblance idea. Yeah, you can define it. You can define all kinds of models, uh, but there's not much agreement uh, on it. Uh, the classic one is games. It's hard to define what a game is. Uh, Wittgenstein argued that you couldn't. Whenever, whenever you would define it, you could find an example that didn't fit the definition. I think business works pretty much, pretty much the same way. So, you know, I, I hope your pro I'm sure your pro project will will come up with some interesting uh, ideas, but I I wouldn't have you know, any sense how to disentangle uh, how these variety of companies look at their stakeholders from the things that you may, may mentioned, what's their, what's their purpose, uh, et cetera. Uh, my experience is a little bit different uh, and, and this, I'm sure this is because of the kind of companies I, I end up uh, seeing here uh, that it's often startups that talk the most about values, that uh, they spend a lot of time uh, saying, now, wait a minute, is this really what we, is this really what we wanna do? Is having this relationship with this venture capitalist really consistent with what our purpose is? So I, I think my experience is that really varies all across the spectrum. I, I worked recently with a really big uh, a natural resource com com company, huge, been around forever. And they were trying to kind of rediscover their purpose. Um, mm -hmm. And then I worked with a set of startups uh, where one of, one of the things those startups do is they really try and articulate, you know, their why, their, 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 their reason for being. So, you know, there are lots of models for, for how to do that. Central to all of them, however, I think, is this idea that your purpose, your why, um, is, 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 is ultimately about how you can 
innovate or not. Okay, great, thanks. So we have a couple of questions here coming in from the audience. And uh, sure. here one is from actually from the co-author of our book here on values-based innovation management, Florian Lüdecke Freund. Florian, you want to ask that directly? Yeah, thanks, Henning. Thanks, Ed, for uh, sharing your thoughts with all of us. Um, so the, the question is very simple. Um, so, so listening to you, it sounds like uh, it doesn't make any sense at all to try to analytically separate, let's say, social value from economical value, because it sounded like economical value creation is inherently social. So the question and, and is... And vice versa. Sorry? And vice versa. And vice versa. So if that's correct, so then I think we can conclude that this very popular, you know, profit versus people <laughs> perspective and discussion is kind of maybe artificial, if not to say meaningless. What do you think? Well, I, uh, look, I'm a prag pragmatist. So let me let me say, I, I think you're exactly right. I would say it's not useful. So rather than meaningless, let me just say, I, I don't I don't know what problem that helps us to solve. It seems to me what it does is it reinforces an old outmoded story about business that business is fundamentally about profits and then people come along people like michael porter they come no no there's social stuff too well yeah look of course it is and of course those things are connected so why why separate them you have a whole bunch of people uh on the left who i've managed to uh, make angry over the years because i think profits are important uh, I mean, everybody's got to get paid. Uh, a business that doesn't make any money doesn't exist. A not-for-profit that doesn't make any money doesn't exist because you don't have anything to invest for the few future. So this idea that profits are bad somehow and are to be contrasted with, you know, uh, pristine environmentally good motives, uh, I, that, that's just, I don't think that leads anywhere. Uh, so I, I think you're you're absolutely right. I would get rid of that di that dichotomy. Thanks a lot. Um, I think this could be debated for quite some some time. But I think, you know, building on this, I think you now we have to rethink a little bit this whole sustainability narrative, including how we justify. I think our research to a certain degree, at least. So, but let me stop here because I think there are so many implications yeah. to this. Thanks a lot. There are a lot. It'd be fun to talk more about those. Thanks. Yeah, we have maybe time for one more here from uh, Carmen. Um, Carmen, do you also want to ask Ed directly? Okay, um, so thank you, Henning, and, um, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, I think it's, you are very inspiring and you make us, you know, uh, revisit a lot of questions that in many cases we take for mm -hmm. granted. So thank you for being so open, you know, to question things. My question to you is, uh, you recently published about how to measure different stakeholders in terms of accounting or, and, and I would like to know uh, whether you, you come up with some system of how can you measure the strength of a stakeholders relationship or any kind of guidance because, you know, measuring means that you can improve things, right? So I, I wonder what can you tell us about that uh, idea? Well, I hope it means you can improve things rather than we can publish things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so, I mean, I mean, really. <laughs> you know, I, yes, I, I would agree with that. I, I, I don't think the measurement question is hard. Uh, look, every company, every co company, measures how it's doing with its customers, and it measures it multiple ways. Every company, well, not every, most companies have some measure of how they're doing with their employees, their employee survey, etc. Um, you could, you know, easily construct measures for suppliers, as some people who do uh, value chain uh, have suggested. And there's nothing wrong with public surveys for how you're doing in a community or opinion leader uh, surveys. And of course, we have ways to measure how we're doing with uh, with 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 investors. So I I don't I think the problem is you. You, there's not one measure that fits everybody. Just like there's not, just like uh, uh, stock price doesn't fit every company. You can measure it, but it's a really poor measurement for lots of co companies depending on their strategy. Uh, and so I like to think of 
this as if I were running a comp, comp company, how would I measure how I'm doing with these stakeholder relationships? And I think that's a different question than how should I measure all stakeholder relationships like that? That's, that's an academic question, but I think ultimately it's one that leads, that leads to bad answers. Uh, etc. If we're looking for profit-like me measurements, profit itself doesn't measure total performance. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what stock price, you know, uh, how, how, how that's translatable across. Surely we can find those. I mean, we put a person on the moon and brought them back. You know, that was a hard problem. Uh, I, I just don't see this as a hard pro problem. Uh, once you take out um, trying to do this across all businesses, you know, for all situations and, 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 and all times. Now, I, I know that's not, uh, you know, that's not, I mean, there is a hard problem here. The hard problem is what's the interaction effect? How, how, how does uh, the, value I, the value I create for customers affect the value I create with employees. Measuring that interaction, I, I think is the hard prop, is the hard prop problem. However you measure value created for a particular stakeholder, looking at how those are connected. So if you can see value created for investors as a function of value created for customers, suppliers, employees, and communities, which many people, I'm one, have argued, but it's perfectly uh, symmetrical. Value for customers is a function of how you create value for suppliers, employees, communities, and investors. So you can write the value created for one stakeholder in terms of the value created, a function of the value created for all, all, all the others. The tricky piece of that equation is the interaction term. You know, how, how you do that. Uh, and it's got to take somebody with a lot better empirical skills, since I have none, uh, to figure to to figure that out. You know, I can write right. the the equations that are there. I did in a in a paper called uh, well, what's it called? Five five challenges to stakeholder theory uh, in a book called Stakeholder Man Man Management. But but taking it further than that is just not something I'm really capable of doing. It's a great question. All right, Ed, thank you very much. That was very motivating. Thank you. Carmen and I and all the others will uh, just pick up that these challenges and continue uh, working with your works as well. As I said, I mean, these are frequently uh, yeah, discussed here at this conference as well. So thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights, sharing your slide recommendations and uh, yeah, we'll uh, keep in touch. Thanks, uh, Henning. I'm, I'm always available to anyone by email, uh, or I'd invite you to listen to the Stakeholder Podcast, which is uh, available on uh, on all the podcast channels. And uh, so thank you very much for having me.